Chapter 120 The Wise Hearted and the Willing Hearted Exodus chapter 35 verses 20 to 35 And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made him willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings, and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering and every man with whom was found shit and wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate, and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver, and of the cunning workman, and of the embroiderer, in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. Exodus chapter 35, verses 20 to 35. These verses continue the emphasis made in verses 4 to 19. Those called by gods are the willing-hearted and the wise-hearted. The wise-hearted are the skilled. The willing-hearted are those who give freely above and over the tithe. The kingdom of God can only be advanced by the willing, those to whom God's work is important, not only in terms of words, but also in terms of giving. There is, however, another very important fact here which is conveniently passed over in our time, the work on the sanctuary did not begin when God gave Moses the pattern and the instructions, but only when the people had donated all the materials, including gold, which were needed for the work. The God who limits debt to six years does not allow for debts where his sanctuary is concerned. Short-term debts for our private concerns is permitted. For God's work, no debt is considered as tenable. In brief, God's work must be done in God's way. Heavy indebtedness marks the modern church and is routinely defended on religious grounds. 
need supposedly creates and poses an emergency which justifies debt. However, if God required that his sanctuary be built with everything in hand, we cannot do otherwise. Moses made an appeal for contributions of various kinds. We do not know what the tablets mentioned in verse 22 were, but the context indicates something of value. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, we are told that God honours and blesses the liberal giver, that is, one who gives well beyond the tithe. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The reference to sowing and seed should not be taken lightly. Only meagre results follow a sparse sowing of seed, whereas bountiful seeding leads to a bountiful harvest. God deals with us in the same way. Poor giving to him leads to poor results. God is mindful of the differences in our estates. Hence, the gifts of precious stones and spices are specifically urged unto the rulers of the tribes, verses 27 and 28. The calling of Bezalel and Holiab goes beyond the statement of Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 to 6. Earlier, they had been appointed to their work. Now, in verses 30 to 35, God also appoints them to teach as well as to work, and he inspires them in both these areas. Those who were called included a variety of artisans, including women skilled in needlework. We have here a curious fact. No scholar regards needlework as a serious art. At the same time, some art galleries are ready to pay large sums of money for not only the needlework of earlier generations, but also for current work. Art is limited by some pretentious persons to a few areas. Another area is that of teaching. In verses 30 to 35, Teaching is associated with the best artisanship. In earlier years, it was the great artists who did the teaching by taking on apprentices. Verse 26 is better read that the woman spun with wisdom, that is, with skill and art. In the Old Testament culture, the artisan had an honoured place. Sirach, in Ecclesiasticus, an apocryphal work, gave a series of meditations on God's law. He classified the physician, the druggist, the scholar, the farmer, the craftsman, the builder, the metal worker, the potter, and the artisan generally as a unit in society, and observed, All these rely on their hands, and each one is skillful in his own work. Without them, no city can be inhabited, and men will not live in one or go about in it. But they are not sought for to advise the people, and in the public assembly they do not excel. They do not sit in the judge's seat. They do not think about the decision of lawsuits. They do not utter instruction or judgment. And they are not found using proverbs. Yet they support the fabric of the world, and their prayer is in the practice of their trade. Chapter 38, verses 31 to 34. While Sirach gave a higher place to the scholars in God's law, his classification here is very important. He saw the artisan as one of the necessary people whose work supports the fabric of the world. The vocations he cited have in common the health and development of society under God. 
Verses 21 to 24 make it clear that not everyone gave to make possible the construction of the sanctuary. They gave as many as were willing-hearted. Verse 22, compare verse 21. God wasted nothing from those not willing to give. The fabric of the world is not upheld or developed by those willing to bless themselves, but not to further God's kingdom. Lange, in his commentary, called attention to the direction of all the law. The one root of the law is the covenant of circumcision, which, from the first, pointed to the circumcision, the regeneration of the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Chapter 30, verse 6. The law, accordingly, is not stationary, but is everywhere a movement in and with the legal man towards regeneration. And the method of this movement is sacrifice, the fundamental type of which appears in the feast of the Passover lamb. This festival looks in its character of sin offering, peace offering and burnt offering towards a process of spiritualizing the law and forms a contrast to the curse offering. Lange's last sentence is regrettable because the direction of the law is not to spiritualize, but to make concrete and specific in our lives and in society God's law and kingdom. He was right in seeing the law as a movement, that is, as a means of creating a direction and structure in society. In our text, this direction becomes apparent again. God's purpose is to make us willing-hearted and wise-hearted. Lange said also, First of all, the law's requirements of deeds must not be toned down. Deeds are a check upon that which is evil, a definition, a picture, a practice of that which is good. But the law as a mirror is the training master to bring to Christ. It leads to a deepening of the inner life till one comes to the hell of self-knowledge, Romans chapter 7. And here only is brought to perfection that entire receptivity for the gospel of grace through which the law is transformed into a fountain of spiritual life. The mistaken view respecting Acts that the mere act is all that is needed, is the root of Judaism, of Pharisaic self-righteousness, though even the mere doing or not doing has its value and reward in the outward world, especially in the regulations of social life. The mistaken view respecting the mirroring of one's self in the law, that the recognition of sin is an end in itself, leads to the deadening of the inner life in self-deprecation, quietism, and pietistic self-torture. This enables us to see the direction which is basic to Exodus. Israel is delivered from bondage to Egypt. It is given God's law, the straight and narrow way of justice. As against man's will, God's law must prevail. Man's will is no better in Israel than it is in Egypt. Israel is forced to recognize its own depravity. The goal is regeneration. The regenerate man is willing-hearted and potentially wise-hearted. He is a necessity for the development of the fabric of the world. The fabric of the world is badly damaged in our time. It cannot be mended or developed without willing-hearted and wise-hearted men and women.